In today's video, I'm taking a look at the Inspire from Azul, a miniature bare bones PC that quite possibly could be the perfect Plex media player. Almost. <laughs> Before I get too far into this video, I just want to say I do have some Plex affiliate links in the description below where you can create a free Plex account and you can also purchase lifetime Plex Pass subscriptions. Anytime you use my affiliate links to do either one of these, it helps me out. Of course, every Plex account is free, but signing up for a lifetime Plex Pass subscription does have some benefits. My personal favorite one is getting firsthand access to some of the newest features that Plex has to offer. So check out the links below for more information. What's up YouTube, Jason here with Bite My Bits. Like I said in the intro, this is the Azul Miniature Desktop PC. It's a bare bones system. You have a few different options for processors. This one in particular has the i5-7200U, but there is an i3 and an i7 option. Now Azul did send this to me for a review, but just like I did with the Byte 3, I'm gonna take a little bit of a different approach to the whole thing. And that is, I want to create basically the perfect Plex Media Player client. And to do that in today's video, I installed a Plex Embedded OS, which is essentially a Plex media player directly installed on top of Linux, a very small version of Linux, and whenever the PC boots up, it goes directly into Plex. You shut it down, it just shuts down. Basically, with Plex Embedded OS, it's just, it has one task. It starts up, it runs Plex, and that's it. No junk running in the background like Windows 10, which is basically one giant spyware. With the only caveat, though, is that you do lose some of the added benefits that you would get from a miniature PC. Something like this is is definitely way more capable than just being a Plex media player. So before I jump into the Plex embedded OS, let's talk about some of the performance I was able to get. So I ran some basic tests. In this particular instance, Cinebench R15. If you don't know already, I did do the review on the Byte 3 miniature PC from Azul. You can check out the cards above to watch that review. But in that review, I did run Cinebench R15. I was only able to get a score of about 114. And in that review, it was not really capable of playing 4K media. It was just it was too limited, at least with Plex, but when it comes to the Inspire, however, with the R15, I was able to get a score of 331. Definitely a huge improvement, almost triple the score of the Byte 3. Huge improvement. On top of that, I also ran PC Mark version 10.0. With the Byte 3, I got 1173. However, with the Inspire, I got 3170 completely demolishing the numbers of the Byte 3. I mean, it was spectacular. And because I was running these numbers and I was getting some pretty substantial gains over the Byte 3, I actually decided to try to play a video game, something that I really didn't even wanna try with the Byte 3. So while in Windows 10, I downloaded Steam and installed a demo from Project Cars 2. And long story short, <laughs> no. It will not play Project Cars 2 to save its life. I mean, 4K, I was just barely even able to exit the game. Taking it down to 1080, while I was technically able to move around the menus a little bit better, just no, not gonna happen. In fact, the only way I could actually get the game to run semi-decent was taking it all the way down to 800 by 600 in windowed mode. So the Intel HD 620 GPU is just not gonna get you any kind of noticeable gaming performance. I mean, it just really, really struggled. 
But that's okay though. The Inspire really, it's it's touted as a production miniature PC, something that, you know, you can fire up some word processor or some Excel, you know, maybe do some PowerPoint, that sort of deal. It's not really being labeled as a gaming device. It's just something that I wanted to try. And I should also note here that I did install the Plex Media Player on top of Windows 10, and for the most part, it ran really smooth. It was able to not only launch, but play 4K content without any kind of noticeable lag. It was overall, just a good experience for what it was. In fact, really everything that I threw at it quality wise, it was able to handle without any issues. So there was really no reason for me to take the adventure into doing a Plex embedded OS installation, except I was curious and I wanted to create something that would directly boot into Plex Media Player without anything in the background taking the performance away from Plex, like Windows 10, because Windows 10 is, well, it's Windows 10. So everything checked out, 4K played fine, 1080p was good, it was able to scrub through, everything was a decent experience, but then I installed Plex Embedded OS, which is actually really simple. I mean, you download the little Linux image from the Plex website, you burn it to a USB using something like Rufus, you plug that into the back of the Inspire, go through the installation process, and before you know it, Plex is set up in its own little dedicated Plex media player. And I have to tell you, this is where you get the feeling of almost having the perfect device for your living room. And I mean, almost perfect. It was just, the only thing that wasn't perfect about it is the remote. I think I mentioned this in the Byte 3 review. I do like the inclusion of the remote. It's a nice, sturdy remote. Feels great, great build quality. Overall, I'm impressed. It's just, a little too limited. I mean, I did a video covering this with some of the other Plex Media clients that I tested, and one of the biggest factors was the usability of the remote. Where sure, a simple remote looks nice and clean and it looks really great, but I want at least some advanced features or even some basic features, like a dedicated rewind or play, pause, stop, going back, things like that. While this one does have what seems to be a backwards button, it doesn't work with the dedicated Plex media client. In fact, in reality, the only thing that really works is this main button here. It's about the only use I could get out of it. So being able to select things, move back and forth, I was able to scrub back and forth through videos, I was able to you know, fumble through pausing or going to the next you know, media that I was trying to play. Um, but in the end, it was it's too much struggle to accomplish something that I could accomplish a lot faster with a remote from something like the Xbox One. But let's talk about that, right? I've been using the Xbox One app for a long time. And when I decided to use the Xbox One as my primary media player, I made a sacrifice. A sacrifice that didn't seem like that big of a deal at the time, but now that I had time to play around with this and truly experience what it is like to have true audio pass through with full surround sound, taking advantage of the large amount of money that I dumped into my surround sound system, I realized that using the Xbox One app was a mistake. Basically with the Xbox One, it has no true surround sound audio pass through. So a lot of the content is limited to 5.1 if you are lucky. I lose out on a lot of the experience, a lot of the, the audio gets transcoded. There's like very little direct play. I mean, it's just, it's a good experience and I've been using it for so long that I just got used to it. But loading this thing up, going through some different test files, going through, you know, Atmos surround sound, 7.1, True HD, Dolby, you know, going through everything that I can. Wow. You really, I really begin to realize that I have been missing out and I've just gotten used to it. Now you take this audio experience and you combine that with this thing running Plex Embedded OS having a completely streamlined and perfect, and I mean this, like perfect browsing experience for content. Fast forwarding and rewinding through a high bit rate 4K video file is instant. Starting up movies, instant. It was just, I mean, it ran circles around my Xbox One as far as being able to launch and go back and forth. I mean, it's amazing. Another example is that the Xbox, when you want to switch to using subtitles, I mean, it's like a five to eight second delay because you have to burn them in from the actual Plex Media server. With this one, if you want to use subtitles, it just reads the file and overlays it on the video on the box itself through the client, making the server work less and your whole experience be smoother. So everything is just snappy. Browsing through files are fast. Scrubbing is just 
instant. The audio quality is amazing. And when you boot this thing up, it just goes directly into the Plex Media Player and you don't have to go through and launch anything or deal with Windows 10 or suffer any kind of performance or anything from Windows 10 running in the background. I mean, Plex Embedded OS really is just perfect on something like this. And when I say perfect, I'm gonna circle right back around to the remote. This makes me want to get into something like a Harmony remote, something that can control the TV, the surround sound, and this device all in one, whether you're using your volume, whether you're turning things on or off, etc. just everything through one remote. I don't know if it would all work perfectly together, but with the performance this thing have, if the remote did work perfectly, it would just be an overall amazing experience. But all this comes at a price. I mean, the Harmony remote itself can run you like anywhere between 50 bucks, probably up to like two or 300 bucks, right? This thing However, the way it's built, bare bone, right out of the box, is gonna cost you like $335. That's gonna give you no storage, no RAM, just an i5 fanless bare bone miniature PC. And the way this thing is built, it has a 960 M.2 Evo drive with 16 gigabytes of DDR4 RAM. I mean, that's a pretty beefy build. The RAM alone, 160 bucks. The Evo in there, 130 bucks. Now you add that with the Zool PC itself, you're looking at $625. So trying to wrap your head around spending $625 dollars for only a dedicated Plex media player, that's going to be a little rough. So obviously, if you did go this route, you would probably want to use it with Windows 10 or a similar operating system and make better use of that hardware, potentially even in a production environment. Because really, that's where this thing sets itself apart. It, you can't game on it, but you can get some production work done. Now, if you wanted to, you could build more of a base model version of this for a heck of a lot cheaper. For example, you can get like four gigs of RAM for like 50 bucks. You can get a super cheap M.2 SSD. It's only gonna give you probably eight gigs of space for like 20 bucks. All in all, that'll cost you about $405. But what you would get with that is literally just an experience that is so snappy, so responsive, so quick, you, you won't wanna look back on anything else. For me, I have to send this thing back. So I'm a little disappointed because I would have loved to maybe invest in a Harmony remote, get everything hooked up, have everything wrapped into one and have the super like snappy, responsive, you know, everything that this thing has but I gotta package it up and send it back next week. If you guys would like to learn more on what I used in this build, you can check out the links in the description. That's gonna show you more detailed specs about the device itself, along with some of the hardware that was put into it with up-to-date pricing. If you have any other questions or anything, leave them in the comments below. As always, thank you for watching, like, and subscribe below, and have a good day.